the University and the Office of Legal Counsel, and I'm currently Title IX Investigative Officer for that office in addition to my teaching responsibilities here. So I was over there and I was talking to the woman who took my job, the new Associate General <laughs> Counsel, and I mentioned this project to her and I said, you know, I talked to Brad and I put a disclaimer on my syllabi and she said, did you get a release from them? And I said, no, I didn't get a release from them. And she said, well, if you're going to pan the audience and have them in it, maybe you ought to get a release. So, what I'm going to do is I have a release here for you to sign <laughs> that says that you will hold me, the university, the College of Business, the Department of Marketing, my heirs, assigns, and anyone else that's a successor in interest to me, uh, totally harmless should the mob come and hunt you down after they find you as a result of this being posted to YouTube. So I'm going to pass that out. And if you would mind signing it and, and you know saying that this was of your own free will and volition, um, that would be much appreciated. If you have a problem signing the release because you want to go talk to your lawyer first or whatever, um, please come see me and I'll try to make sure that you're not in the frame at least for today, for the, for the part of the class that we're going to answer today. So I'm going to turn the camera off for just a second. And I will... All right. So while he's handing out the rest of those, I'm going to talk to you about the first two questions that I'm going to ask you for today's uh, critical thinking challenge in marketing. All right? And if you'll look, for those of you who actually managed to come for the first day of class on Tuesday, you should already have your bonus points from that class session posted to the D2L website. If I got it wrong and you were here and you want to you know, argue with me, you can come up after class and I'll be happy to make sure you get those points, but I want to get to today's two questions. The first of these questions is we're going to look at an overview beginning with marketing. Is, is marketing an art or a science? And then I want you to justify that answer with substantive Examples. In other words, how is it an art or science? The second part of this question is, is everything on a college campus either an art or a science, or is there another category out there? Is there something besides arts and sciences that you can think of? So those are the first two preliminary questions. These are not terribly difficult in terms of their critical thinking questions. So I'm going to give you just about five minutes to get in your groups and answer those. Write something down, and we'll look at your answers. After that, we're going to look at a film, and I'm going to ask you how these questions apply to the film and then to marketing. OK, so you got five minutes. Sounds like you all are wrapping up. So, to the first one, I was talking with some of the groups around here asking if you had a question, and the group back there had a particularly interesting answer. What was your answer? Art is a science. Art is a science. Okay? Anybody disagree with that point? Okay, why do you think art is a science? Because even if you go look at like the attitudes and the emotions that come from different arts can actually be defined as science. Okay, how so? We have like colors and melodies and that kind of stuff, which are more and what emotion in each color and tones and sounds can actually apply. Okay. Do you want to disagree? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's not really the path that you can go on. If 
part with the science and anyone could learn it. And we would all be singing like Beyonce, but we don't. And so I think that art is art. You think art is art? Okay, I saw, first of all, there was a hand back there. Yes, ma'am. Design is an art, right? 
But whether or not people respond positively to that then becomes a science. And for those of you who said that there is emergence between art and science, that's absolutely true. We're now seeing things that we used to think forever and ever and ever to be universal truths, to be questioned, and to be under the examination of scientific inquiry. For example, one of the age-old adages is that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Right? We all think that, don't we? Turns out it's not. When we ask people to draw an ideal picture, in all different cultures, they all come up with the same kind of scene. It's a pastoral scene with water and flora and fauna, and it's sort of arranged in this proportionality. If we take children, small babies, that are absolutely honest, right? And we, we sit there and we show them cards, or we flash pictures in front of them. They'll look at what is considered a classically beautiful face much longer than what is a disproportionate face. They will look at that Denzel Washington absolute symmetry for, for minutes. You show the kid a picture of Lyle Lovett and they start walling screaming at the top of their lungs, right? So now what we're going to do, I'm going to move the uh, boards out of the way. We're going to, if you want to just move the camera for just a bit, we're going to watch a brief video presentation. And I want to see how this can apply, what lessons we can take from this for marketing as an art and a science. So this is a TED Talk, which stands for Technology education and development and we'll get the computers to come back on I'll flip the screen and I want you to think about how this can apply to marketing hopefully the technology will work Downloaded it from Disney.com or one of these websites. 
14 days after putting the computer in their village. So at the end of it, we concluded that groups of children can learn to use computers and the internet on their own, irrespective of who or where they work. At that point, I became a little more ambitious and decided to see what else could children do with the computer. We started off with an experiment in Hyderabad, India, where I gave a group of children, they spoke English with a very strong Telugu accent. I gave them a computer with a speech-to-text interface, which you now get free with Windows. And uh, after the speak into it, so when they spoke into it, uh, the computer typed out gibberish. So they said, well, it doesn't understand anything of what we are saying. So I said, yeah, I'll leave it here for two months. Make yourself understood to the computer. So the children said, how do we do that? And I said, uh, well, I don't know. And, <laughs> and I left. <laughs> Two months later, and this is now documented in the uh, Information Technology for International Development Journal, their accents had changed and were remarkably close to the neutral British accent in which I had trained the speech-to-text synthesizer. In other words, they were all speaking like James Tooley. <laughs> so you can, uh, they could do that on their own. After that, I started to experiment with various other things that they might learn to do on their own. Um, I got an interesting phone call once from Colombo, from the late Arthur C. Clark, who said, I want to see what's going on. And he couldn't travel, so I went over there. He said two interesting things. A teacher that can be replaced by a machine should be. The second, <laughs> the second thing he said was that if children have interest, then education happens. And I was doing that in the field, so every time I would watch it and think of it. Possible. And uh, they can definitely uh, help people because children critically learn to navigate the way and find things which interest them. And when you've got interest, then you have education. I took the experiment to South Africa. This is a 15 year old boy. This I think games, like animals. And I, I listen to music. And I asked him, uh, do you send emails? And he said yes, and they hop across the ocean. This is in Cambodia, rural Cambodia. A very silly arithmetic game, which no child could play inside the classroom or at home. They would you know, throw it back at you and say, this is very boring. If you leave it on the pavement, and if all the adults go away, then they will show off with each other about what they can do. Which is what uh, these children are doing. They are trying to multiply it. And all over India, at the end of about two years, children are beginning to Google their homework. As a result, the teachers reported tremendous improvements in their English. <laughs> you know, rapid improvements, all sorts of things. They said they've become really deep thinkers and so on and so forth. And, uh, I mean, if, if there's stuff on Google, why would you need to stuff it into your head? So at the end of the next four years, I decided that groups of children can navigate the internet to achieve educational objectives on their own. At that time, a large amount of money had come into Newcastle University um, to improve schooling in India. So Newcastle gave me a call, they said, I'll do it from Delhi. They said, there's no way you're going to handle a million pounds worth of uh, you know, university money. Um, uh, sitting in Delhi. So uh, in 2006, I bought myself a heavy overcoat and moved to Newcastle. <laughs> I wanted to test the limits of this system. The first experiment I did out of Newcastle was actually done in India, and I set myself an impossible target. Can Tamil speaking 12 year old children in a South Indian village? teach themselves biotechnology in English on their own. And I thought, I'll test them, they'll get a zero, I'll give them material, I'll come back and test them, they'll get another zero, I'll go back and say, yes, we need teachers for certain things. I called in 26 children, they all came in there, and I told them that there's some really difficult stuff on this computer, I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't understand anything. Um, it's all in English, and uh, I'm, I'm worried. 
<laughs> I left them with him. I came back after two months and the 26 children marched in looking very, very quiet. I said, well, did you look at any of the stuff? Said, yes, we did. Did you understand anything? No, nothing. So I said, well, how long did you practice on it before you decided that you understood nothing? I said, we look at it every day. So I said, for two months you were looking at stuff you didn't understand. So a 12-year-old girl raises her hand and says, literally, apart from the fact that improper replication of the DNA molecule causes genetic disease, we've understood nothing else. <laughs> It took me three years to publish that. It's just been published in the British Journal of Education and Technology. One of the referees who refereed the paper said, it's too good to be true. <laughs> Which was not very nice. <laughs> well, one of the girls had taught herself to become the teacher. And then that's her over there. Remember, they don't study English. When I asked where is the neuron, and she says, the neuron, the neuron, and then she says, this, this. <laughs> this what her expression was not very nice. So, When I asked where is the neuron, and she says, the neuron, the neuron, and then she looked at this, this. <laughs> what her expression was not very nice. So, <laughs> so their scores have gone up from 0 to 30 percent, which is an educational impossibility under the circumstances. But 30 percent is not a pass. So I, I found that they had a friend, a local accountant, a, a young girl, and they played football with her. I asked that girl, would you teach them enough biotechnology to pass? And she said, how would I do that? I don't know the subject. I said, no, use the method of grandmother. She said, what's that? I said, well, what you've got to do is stand behind them and admire them all the time. <laughs> Just say to them, that's cool, that's fantastic, what is that? Can you do that again? Can you show me some more? She did that for two months. The scores went up to 50, which is what the posh schools of New Delhi with a trained biotechnology teacher were getting. So I came back to Newcastle with these results and decided that there was something happening here that definitely was getting very serious. So having experimented in all sorts of remote places, I came to the most remote place that I could think of. <laughs> Across the river tide, 5,000 miles from Delhi, is the little town of Gateshead. In Gateshead, I took 32 children and I started to, to fine-tune the method. I made them into groups of four. I said, you make your own groups of four. Each group of four can use one computer and not four computers. Remember, from the whole world. You can exchange groups. You can walk across to another group if you don't like your group, etc. You can go to another group, peer over their shoulders, see what they're doing, come back to your own group and claim it as your own work. And I explained to them that, you know, a lot of scientific research is done using that method. <laughs> the children enthusiastically got after me, so now what do you want us to do? I gave them six GCSE questions. The first group, the best one, solved everything in 20 minutes. The worst, in 45. 
They use everything that they knew. News groups, Google, Wikipedia, Ask Jeeves, etc. The teacher said, is this deep learning? I said, well, let's try it. I'll come back after two months. We'll give them a paper test. No computers, no talking to each other, etc. The average score when I got it with the computers and the groups was 76%. When I did the experiment, when I did the test after two months, the score was 76%. There was photographic recall inside the children. I suspect because they're discussing with each other. A single child in front of a single computer will not do that. I have further results which are almost unbelievable of scores which go up with time. Because their teachers say that after the session is over, the children continue to Google further. Here in Britain, I put out a call for British grandmothers after my Google experiment. Well, you know, with the, the very vigorous people, British grandmothers, 200 of them volunteered immediately. The, the, the deal was that they would give me one hour of broadband time sitting at their homes one day in a week. So they did that. And over the last two years, over 600 hours of instruction has happened over Skype using what my students call the granny cloud. The granny cloud sits over there. I can beam them to whichever school I want to. starts to do things 
which it was never designed for. Which is why you react the way you do, because it looks impossible. I think I can make a guess now. Education is a self-organizing system where learning is an emergent phenomenon. It will take a few years to prove it experimentally, but I'm going to try. But in the meanwhile, there is a method available. One billion children, we need 100 million mediators, there are many more than that on the planet. 10 million souls, 180 billion dollars and 10 years. We could change everything. Thank you. challenge, critical thinking challenge today. What can marketers learn from this? From the children in the hole in the wall experiment. About the combination of art and science. You have 10 minutes. Go. Uh, into a term that marketing scholars call value co-creation. Okay? Now, I told you last time that you walked in the door and you didn't know anything about some of the subjects that you had at a college campus. You probably didn't know anything about trigonometry before you took it. But you walked into this classroom and you did know something about marketing because you've been marketed to from the first day um, that you were born until the, the minute that you die. We will market to you. And then we'll market to you after you're dead. Right? We'll continue to market to you after you're dead. But you've never probably heard the term, except for maybe a few of you, of value co-creation. But you knew what it is. And it's this idea of the hole in the wall. That if you get people interested, they'll help themselves help you. As marketers, we can no longer just provide products out there and shoddily made products. We have to engage in a value co-creation process with our consumer. Make them a part of the team, right? And this is the combination and the intersection of the art and the science. We can study the consumer from a scientific perspective, but it takes an art to ask them the right questions. What is it that interests you? What is it that you want? Think about Google Glass. How many of you want Google Glass? That's the ultimate in value co-creation, isn't it? It allows you to take this tool and do what with it? What do you, why do you want to Google Glass? So I can Google stuff with just walking? Stuff. So you can Google stuff while you're just walking? Yeah. See stuff? Take a picture? If you want things, take a video? I actually saw a guy with Google Glasses on uh, about a month ago, and I wanted to tackle him and steal them. <laughs> <laughs> right? All right. Very good. Well. Let's talk a little bit about the domain of marketing then. If you want, that's, that's all up for the uh, right. critical thinking today. So um, let's talk a little bit about the domain of marketing. If we say that marketing is a science, we're going to have to define what that science is, right? We're going to have to come up with what is the area of science. And so I want you to think about this. What is the first thing that we do when we decide something's a science? Well, we start coming up with definitions. And this is the really boring part. But this is where you're going to think critically about things again. So the first definition of marketing came from the American Marketing Teachers Association in 1935. And it was, that was the predecessor to what we call the American Marketing Association. And this definition of marketing says marketing is the performance of business activities that direct the flow of goods and services from producer to consumer. Marketing is the performance of business activities that direct the flow of goods 
and services from producer to consumer. Now, I'll put that up on, on D2L. It's a good thing that you're writing it down. One of the things we know from the pedagogy research is that what you write down, you have a tendency to remember more photographically, right? What's wrong with that definition of marketing? It's not inclusive enough. It's very narrow. It focuses on what? It focuses, focuses on what? Business activities, right? Um, and marketing is not just about business, is it? How else can we use marketing? We can use marketing socially. We can use marketing personally, right? In our interactions with people. How many of you have a group of friends that you hang out with? Right? A lot of you. There are none of you that are socially awkward in here. Right? Don't have any friends. In that group of friends, as you think about them, is there one person that's a sort of a leader? That does all the planning? Why do they do the planning? They always have the bright ideas? Because they're a leader. Because they're a leader? Have they marketed themselves to you to believe that they're the ones that should decide where the group goes? Sure. they persuaded you, haven't you? Haven't they? And there's some exchange there between you, right? You give up some of the decision-making ability to do what? Enjoy the ride. Enjoy the joy ride. Rock set song. I'm dating myself here. Right? <laughs> you don't know who rock set is. Sure. The definition changed in the mid-1980s and said, marketing is the process of planning and executing the conception, pricing, promotion, and distribution of ideas, goods, and services to create exchanges that satisfy individuals and organizational objectives. Now this is getting broader. Now we're saying it's, it's individuals, it's organizations, uh, goods and services, ideas is included in that. So we're getting broader in our definition of things, right? The new definition, as released in this in your text, says marketing is an organizational function and set of processes for creating, communicating, and delivering value to customers and for managing customers' relationships in ways that benefit the organization, stakeholders, and society as a whole. Now, I think this is a more inclusive definition, but I would add one thing to it. This is a test question. Isn't that nice of me? I tell you things are test questions. Generally, when I say things are test questions, you should write them down. I said that last semester. I had a girl that sat right in the middle of the class. I said, you should write it down. And I looked at her, and she put her pen down, folded her arms, rolled her eyes, and sighed. And I said, you know, it's unimportant whether or not you like me. What's important is that I like you. <laughs> From a great standpoint. <laughs> so, what do I think should be added to this? I think that we should add to that that marketing is, as I said at the beginning, the first day, a pervasive, social activity. It is a pervasive social activity. We do it constantly. Now, I want you to think about, for next time, because we'll have to move rapidly, about the philosophies that are talked about in your textbook and we'll talk about those. So we have this sort of philosophy of the production era, or the production model, and then the selling. Look at those, and be prepared to think about what is limiting or what's wrong with those, and how we can go and move from them to this era of value co-creation. I'm letting you go a few minutes early so that you can think about that. Also, this will give you an opportunity to get back to your groups, really start exchanging phone numbers, 
I will give you from time to time time in this classroom to work in your groups. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I know that the project is a major project and a lot of you have things. The minute you leave these doors, you go elsewhere and you have jobs and lives. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. What? Yes, turn in your papers that you did for your groups today. And I didn't pass the roll sheet, did I? I forgot. No. Thank you. And I need your uh, your uh, other forms that I gave you. 